So thank you very much, Andy. So this, this brings me back 30 years because I was the first time here reading lectures about 30 years back. And that time it was normal to have full hour lecture and start 15 minutes later. So it was scheduled sharp, but the people didn't expect to start earlier than 15 minutes later. So we are 17, so it's not that bad. So my lecture is on actually very similar things as you heard from Andy and Michael Eastwood, because I'll be talking about tractors and tractor calculus and come to sequences of operators there. The DGG type or like sequences. And this is mainly following or closely following our joint paper with Michael Eastwood. And actually it was, oh, it doesn't work. Oh, it stopped working. Ah, no, it does. It's great. So you see, it's quite dense the the slide. So I hope to come through. And the beginning was around 2012, where Mike was already having his paper with Hubert Goldschmidt. And they were interested in having complete characterization of, of the range of some operator by a curl of another one. So typically what you call to have an exact knot in a sequence, right? And you see they were working on CPM with some specific operators. I should like to come back to these specific operators in my very last slide. And they found this complete characterization and was good enough to come to Journal of Differential Geometry. And Michael was interested in some general scope, general reason why this happens. And I wanted to see it in a similar way, similar, similar setup as the DGG sequences are, except this was for CPN with no parabolic structure here, right? So, he suggested to discuss this a little bit, and we did many years in the coming time. And actually, I was rather part of the discussions. All the computations that you will see, they are rather tedious and technical and nice in my beautiful style, and we never ever be able to compute these complicated things, right? But Mike insisted having me as co-author, and I have the pleasure now to talk about. So let's first look at the CPN itself. So it, CPN, we have got three structures there. It's a Riemannian space where you have the Fubinish to metric, you have the complex structure there, and you have the Kähler form there. Everything Jan, is there. Could, could you please center this, and the, the so, slide? Moreover, the three guys are very nicely linked together. You see in the table on the right hand side. So JBC is the symplectic form with the indices down. And if, if it had the indices up, it's the inverse of the symplectic form as a matrix, right? And, and you can get to JCA by pushing up the indices. We shall have to be careful because also later we shall have sometimes metrics, sometimes symplectic form, and the indices will be pushed up and down by either that or, or the other one. Yes, so I will try to keep track about that. So that's in writing what I told about. So, so the symplectic form and the levi civita connection are very nicely linked. And there are, as already mentioned, special complexes of operators where you can characterize the range and curl of them. And what you have to notice at the first glance is that actually the complexes are by one slot longer than the Deram, which is which sounds surprising, right? And, and rings the bells. And on top of all that, there are very few Keller manifolds with the Ricci type holonomy, which is the case here. And this can be also read from very recent memoirs of American Math Society, but it's only recently published. Actually, the preprint was in the complete form without changes was already up in 2015. Just sorry, is something wrong? People in the uh, external system cannot see the full slides they don't see the full slide that's great i don't know why but i have to kind of change it here yes 
Even like you this can, is better. Can share the application instead of sharing the screen in Zoom, and that usually helps. Yeah, it's the application. So I just want to stop the sharing and try to do it again. Maybe it's on. It's your your hands. <laughs> Yeah, so, so now everybody sees already also the last lines I was talking about. So this is actually also from before 2015. So I'm talking about quite old stories today. Uh, yeah. Yes? Uh, you know, you say the complexes are longer than the actual ground complex with respect to the, the real dimension of the Yes, yeah. by one. Ah. We shall come to that soon. Okay. And, and the reason is I can tell it in advance. So the reason is that in some sense you can see the complexes as push down of contact geometry complexes, which are one dimensional bigger, right? So <clears throat> Michael simply wanted to understand how this works and why this works. And he wants to see for some reasonable category of ge geometries, right? Like a reasonable class of geometries where CPN would be a distinguished example of it, right? And we just came back to that in 2015 and finished the preprint. And then the preprint became the advances paper I, I referred to on the title page. And in parallel, we also produced a different explanation of the same thing, which was in, in the collection from study. Uh, yes. And Roughly speaking, what we want to do is to, to or we want what, what Mike wanted to do was to mimic as much as possible development and construction of the tractor connection and the tractor calculus used to build the BGG calculus. Uh, and, and, and we wanted to follow what we knew from conformal geometry in particular and wanted to get some analog for, for the symplectic manifolds. And of course, talking about symplectic, it's very nicely matched with Riemannian, where you simply swap symmetric and anti-symmetric things, and you get very, very good match of concepts and results, although not everything looks the same then. And here, we should, should expect that actually we have to face some conformal analogy of, of the conformal Riemannian manifolds. And this is what we what we did before entering what I call conformally symplectic and conformally Fedosov. Uh, I should like to mention a parallel development of the same or similar story, which was done in parallel, but by Andy and Tomas Saj. So further is this nice paper about pushing down the Rubin complex to conformally symplectic quotients. And the point there is that if you if you happen to have a contact manifold with some nice transversal infinitesimal automorphism, some kind of reback profile, which is which is uh, an automorphism, then you can quotient it out. You get a symplectic quotient, and the things like Rubin complex can be pushed down there. And then there is a series of three more papers on the topic linked to the special special holonomies you get on the symplectic manifolds from different choices of parabolic contact structures. And for all of them, you can trace some nice things happening there. So now we are at the conformally symplectic manifold. So it's quite well known and long time studied object. So a conformally symplectic manifold is again an even dimensional manifold where you have a non degenerate two form, except you don't insist to be closed. And instead, you want that the differential of the form will be in the same ideal generated by J itself. So there will be, more explicitly, there will be a one form alpha, so that the differential of J is obtained as wedge product of, of this alpha with J. And for technical reasons, it's reasonable to write two alpha there. Uh, 
This is called the reform, and if the dimension is at least six, it's automatically closed. In the dimension six, in the dimension four, we assume it to be closed. Wow. And the nice thing is that it makes sense because if you rescale our symplectic or nearly so conformally symplectic form J, if we rescale it by a positive smooth function, so a square of some non zero function omega, then you witness a very similar behavior to what, what we know from conformal geometry because. First, it again will have the same features, and the one form to be chosen, the Lee form, is rescaled very nicely. You simply add the differential of the logarithm, so the logarithm is very sure. It's just, yeah, it's straightforward computation. Yeah, yeah. So we can use this observation as a background for the definition, so it's just a reformulation. So a, Conformally symplectic manifold is simply a pair, the manifold plus a class of equivalent non degenerate forms where the equivalence is defined as being rescaled in the above way, right? So, so this is what we, what we understand under conformally symplectic. And uh, now a very important notion. If we take some smooth vector bundle E, which is over a conformally symplectic manifold, we say that the connection, so a connection on such a bundle is symplectically flat if the commutator of the covariant derivative with respect to the connection has the property that it's a multiple of the symplectic form itself, J times some endomorphism theta of E. So it's algebraic on E and it's multiple of J. Of course, if you take another J, you will have the same property with accordingly multiplied theta, right? So it's nothing, nothing tricky there, it's straightforward. So this is a very crucial definition for us. You will see immediately why, because it's relatively straightforward to build a beautiful calculus for this for these symplectically flat connections. So uh, I have a question. This is what it is. So the first step Hello? is you can push down the Lumen complex, and instead of doing it from the from something contact, it's a relatively straightforward observation that you you just check and try and see how to deform the differential or mod modify the differential in order to get a complex. The perps at the lambda mean the trace-free forms, which is, which is actually what's meant by trace-free is that it's in the kernel of, of the batch product of J, which is the same as being trace-free with respect to the traces is the inverse to J, right? For, for the name. And everything is sort of straightforward, and, and it's not that difficult to, to find out how the operators would be. So that the first one, for example, is there, it's just the exterior differential on function, so the normal differential on far function minus two alpha. That's the modification which makes it behaving well. The only tricky point is the middle operator. So, so the one going from lambda n perp to lambda n perp. So it's in the middle dimension where you get a second order operator, which makes it all together to a nice complex. Right. So, so, yes. There's a question in the chat. Yeah. Just read out. So come on up. In the previous slide, it was sigma section E. Why was there the remark about torsion frequency, which makes sense only for the tangent bundle? Uh, yes, so so here you have to understand in such a way that uh, in order to be able to iterate the covariant derivative, you have to, to know how to do that because the, the value of the first covariant derivative will be already lambda one tensor E, right? And therefore to help yourself, you have to choose some auxiliary connection. You use it to iterate but the outcome of the commutator will be the same independent of the choice of the, of the torsion-free connection. 
right? So it's it's a good question. So I I just so it's it's just meant what what's written in the parentheses below the the box. That's what I what I try to explain now. I hope it's enough. So he says I see. So it's not the exterior covariant group. No. No. So um, coming back here. So what we what we want to do, what we aim for is to take this very pushed down mean complex and try to couple it to make sense on for every bundle E. And in order to do that, we need that the connections are symplectically, symplectically flat. So that's that's an important ingredient. And just to have some feeling about it, let's look at the first at the, at the first operators here. So the first operator will be just the same with the nabla instead of the d, right? And you, you just subtract two alpha a, which means two alpha a times identity on e, right? Tensorized. And the curvature of this connection will be just what we get from the symplectic flatness assumption. And this is very important for the further proceedings because, because then we can continue. We get, we get this next operator, which will be, which will be just, just as written in the bottom line, modulo JAB, because we, we, we have to land in the lambda two curve. So we compute everything modulo the symplectic form JAB, so nearly symplectic form JAB. And it's quite straightforward to prove that the endomorphism theta has constant rank in such a situation. And before we, we can consider the bundles, which are the kernel of theta and the co-kernel of theta, they are well defined. They have the same dimension at each point. And remarkably, the connection D, which I had on the previous slide, that the first operator in the sequence, is a flat connection on both of these bundles. And we can write, we can take the sheets of germs of convariant constant sections on the bundles. Therefore, right? So, so that's, that's the kern, kernel theta and co-kernel theta underlined. And then there is this main lemma for the further proceedings, because it's again, it took us years to see the observation nicely, but then it's a simple observation that you can just put together the arrows this way, as indicated on the bottom line. And you have two times sort of the same complex, which is linked together with, with these two, two arrows. And one of them comes shifted by one. Right. So this is the way how you write the things down. And of course, it's essential to have the theta there, right? So, so the symplectic flatness is very important in the construction. And using this, you can, you can build the complex we were aiming at, and it will be just having the right form. So the coupled complex is E as the values of the forms. And all the operators are again first order operators, only the middle one will be second order operator. And you can prove relatively again it's tedious. Yes. Which do you mean diagonal? Yes, that's the identity. Yeah, the, the down, downwards diagonals are just the identities. Uh, it's just in multiplication by theta. No, 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 it's, it's, just, it's just written down, you see? So it's, I mean, where do I have the pointer here? So it's here, you take phi and eta, so they sit here and here. Mm -hmm. And from the phi, okay, you, plus minus C, C, five. You, you move here. So it's d eta minus eta phi. Okay. So that's the downwards one. And it's always once minus once plus here, the same, right? 
So actually you always have B of the appropriate one. Here you take B of the same and you subtract. It's down diagonal as multiplied by theta and up diagonal cancel. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, theta is endomorphism, so it's just hit by theta. Yes. Right, thanks for the question. All right, you have questions, but then the feeling that the people are listening. Um, right, so here we have the complex, and it's relatively straightforward, but tedious as my access to check by some spectral sequences chasing. I will just indicate it on the next slide. That actually this complex is everywhere exact except except at the zeros and first positions. So the zeros at first cohomologies are <coughs> non-trivial, and actually they are identified nicely with the kernel of theta and co-kernel of theta. Yes, theta was used in the construction, so it's not such a surprise that it appears. Yeah, but it's nice that it's exact everywhere except at these two places and, and and you know about the cohomology and here is the indication how it works so so the point is that you have this nice shift by one and so so you you get a filtered complex right down the, the sequence and at the already e2 level you get what you what you requested right so let's move on. So now we are at the conformally fed us off that up because that's what we want to do because now we have the generic calculus. Whenever you have a bundle E with a symplectically flat connection, you are able to get the requested complexes, right? Now our goal was to see such a nice bundle in particular for the CPN. <laughs> first question came from, right? And there we needed to start with a bit more than just conformally symplectic structure, right? And what, what Mike was observing was the nice coexistence of the symplectic class as the conformal class of the equivalent nearly symplectic forms in the conformally symplectic setup together with a class of well-adjusted affine connections, right? And, and this, yes? Well, it seems that the many forces can be connected. We can always just scale for the fact that the function of the right? Because alpha is always D of some function. Yes, yeah, I will come, I will come to that. There it makes sense only to know the many forces. Uh, yes and no, because it's a, just to, to consider the whole class of the conformally symplectic yeah, forms. Yeah, always choose one which is symplectic. No, no, just, just to, to, to see the whole thing. And, and, and if you want to have a calculus where all the objects are behaving well, it's a good guideline what kind of calculus you want. Right? Because otherwise it would be, it's something like, like if you have the operators on Riemannian manifolds, those which are conformally invariant are simply more interesting. So even if you start with a metric, it's interesting to know about those operations which are conformally invariant, right? So, so here we are in a similar situation. It's like the model in metric, it's, it's an integrable principle expression. Mm -hmm. also the conditions. Yeah, yeah, but of course you are in some sense right, and you will see later that it will be even stronger in, in your sense that the could restrict to simpler objects, right? It's like an Einstein, I'm an Einstein method. Yeah. So, so let us remind what a projective class of connections is. It's what the people call projective structure. You simply have a class of connections which transform the right way, right? And they, they can be characterized by having the same geodesics. And using that, we can define an equivalence relation on pairs where J is a almost symplectic thing, and Nabla is a connection in the project class. And notice that if we rescale, if we rescale the, uh, well, it's not noticed, it just, it just 
request that if you rescale the conformal symplectic form by omega square, then you want to see that the projective connection will rescale with the help of the epsilon, right? And this helps us to make it more standard because we can request, you can't request that the connection will always make the symplectic form JBC parallel. I mean, the matching connection, but you can request that at least this will be again given by the Lee form alpha in this sense, right? So, so first of all, it will have these symmetry properties. It will be undisymmetric in B and C again, and it will just be given this way. And so, so we just want to see the conformally symplectic forms paired with connections, and we can do it in a nice way so that the rescaling would mean almost projective rescaling, and that would be called conformally feathers of manifolds. Right? Feathers of manifolds would be, would be those with connection where the J is parallel, and J would be a symplectic form. Right? And now a few remarks are due. Let's look at my time. Uh, so first of all, it's obvious that if you start with a conformally symplectic structure, then you always can find a class of projective connections, a projective class of connections, which would match properly, right? That's easy. You simply write down the equation you want to see, right? So if you push up the, the indices you get here, and you also push these index up with alpha, so, so it's done by the symplectic form, right? On the other hand, if we start with a projective class of connections, it's clear that we can't achieve that in general because the necessary condition will be an overdetermined system. And it could be solved on always, only sometimes, right? And the, and the condition, the obstruction is actually here. Moreover, now I come back to your observation. Actually, we always can rescale in such a way, because if you remember, the alpha itself rescales so that you, you add the epsilon. So if you choose the epsilon to be a minus alpha, you simply know how to rescale to get the Fedosov gauge, what we call Fedosov gauge, right? So it will be the, the guy is alpha equals zero. And if alpha is zero, then it means that the, that the J is actually parallel. Yeah, so we still, and, and not only is parallel, it's also closed because, because the differential of J is given as alpha batch J, right? So, so, so we simply get to a symplectic setup with a Fedosov connection. Now, let's have a look at the curvature. So this goes exactly as what we heard yesterday or the day before, the day before from Mike. Uh, if you come up with things like that, you may ask what the decomposition, the relevant decomposition of. And here we are. So if you start with a with, with any choice of the J and Nabla in, in the class, right? You get you get the curvature of the connection. And the connection all splits into something which should remind the vagal part and the rest. Again, you see there is this row. The row is a bit simpler than what you could remember from the conformal. There were four terms. But that's because the vagal part is more complicated. Right? And the conditions which characterize the component is that row, row is symmetric, while the veil part is characterized by these three conditions. Right? So, so it's anti-symmetric with those two. That's clear because it was the curvature. It's it, it, it hasn't got this kind of trace and also not this trace. And if we conformally rescale, which means we rescale both the things at the same time, we rescale, we rescale the J and the 
NABLA, as, as was indicated on the previous slide. So remember, one will be over this joint rescaling of the two objects, right? Then the role changes very much like in conformal geometry, which looks just the same. So that there will be the one half here. Right? And the veil part is W. If we push all the indices down, then it could be uniquely decomposed in this way. So you see, this is rather the full analog of the veil curvature in conformal geometry, and you have the remaining symmetric parts, which, which there were already given by the one row, but, but here it splits into two independent ones. We shall come back to that later. So, <clears throat> so V is now having more symmetries. It's symmetry in CD. It's got this, this property as before, and it has got also this property as before, right? And the phi is again symmetric. So this looks horribly complicated. So let us have a look what it what it would be on the CPN itself, where the where the guys are also nicely linked together. There is, of course, much simpler. There, the curvature of the Fubini, Fubini study metric is given automatically this way. So it's just something which is built in a very straightforward way from the metric and the symplectic form. One can easily compute then that rho is again a multiple of g, and phi is again a multiple of g, and this v is zero. Yeah. That's the most important part. Well, if we look at the Fedosov gauge, but before I, I, I was just dealing in general with the things, and the veil part was, was really independent of the choice, whereas the rho was changing, right? But if you are in the Fedosov gauge, everything gets a little bit simpler. So for those who like the linking diagrams with the numbers, so this is what, what the guys are. So this is the V, the trace-free part, the V trace-free part, this is the phi, just the symmetric things. And this is the row again, just the symmetric forms without any weights. Right? And, and the, the complete decomposition boils down to something much simpler too, because you see it's just this. So you have the phi there and you have the row there. And moreover, you can see that the row and phi will be different only by some multiple, right? So we are very much back in the setting similar to the conformal geometry because you have just the row and the completely trace-free part, the V. <clears throat> yeah, so as, as I already mentioned, so there is this distinguished Fedosov gauge, and the choice and also the choice of the name is completely in accordance with the notion of Fedosov manifolds. So people are using for ages. Right, any questions? Not so far. So let's let's have a, the last look at the curvature. What happens if the if it's not if it's even nicer, if it's like in the CPN case, if it's a if it's a Kähler case, so so then we know that the levi civita connection of the metric is what what's what's the NAPLA? That's that's our choice, right? But it's it's the choice we make, and then of course we can compute further, and then the curvature then decomposes into something which looks even more widely, but it's just a more detailed decomposition, right? So what we get there first is the total trace-free part with respect to all three of the guys, to the metric, to the, to the complex form and the, the symplectic form, right? Then there is another bit where the psi is trace-free and symmetric. Then there is another bit where the sigma is actually the image of psi under J, under the complex form, so it's Q, right? So it's nothing new there. It's just another another bit how the how the psi just appears there. And the last one is a scalar scalar curvature part, which appears like this, right? So, so this is how it looks in the scalar case. 
And consequently, consequently, you can just do some straightforward calculations, which I can do easily, I would never handle. And, and in the end, we established that actually in this case, you even can uh, even can get the V completely computed from the sigma. So it's just link this way. Uh, well, no, no, the trace. How is it? Yes. This this double trace of V with J is just what you get by sigma. Right. So that's that's the curvature preparation. Now we can come to the tractors. So just a very quick reminder. So these are the tractors you saw in many lectures already here, in particular in Mike's, perhaps also in Andy's. Um, so the standard tractors, you can imagine you have the, the big group G of the model. So, so in the conformal geometry, it's the, it's the SON plus one, one for positive definite SON two for Lorentz signature, etc. And you take the standard representation on R and plus two, and you notice that it gets the filtration and it decomposes into these three parts. This is the middle slot, which mimics up to weight the tangent bundle. And here are the two one dimensional line bundles. One, one is included, so one is just the embedded one, and the other one is the projective one, right? Injective and projective parts. And because it's filtration, if you rescale the metric, so as Mike was talking about the densities nicely, explaining that density is something like a function, except if you change your metric in the conformal class, you know how, the, how, the, how it changes. So here in the filter, filter setup, it's more complicated because if you change your choice of the metric in the conformal class, everything rescales by the epsilons. Epsilons are the logarithmic derivatives of the omega square, right? And, and so, so it's a little bit messy because the injective, injecting part stays as it is, and the others get, get modified. Right? And, and so this is the formula from conformal geometry. And moreover, in the conformal geometry, we saw the tractor connection. And the tractor connection could be either built directly from what you can find already at the flat model, because all the things, if you conformally deform the flat metric, you see them there, right? Or you can go the other way around. You can, you can just learn or know how to construct the canonical Cartan connection as an absolute parallelism of the principal fiber bundle. Then you know that it's actually a genuine principal connection on the extended bundle. And therefore, all the representations of the whole G will lead to bundles, which we call tractors, and will carry a canonical associated connection. And it's a very straightforward game to write down explicitly the formulae in every of the veil structures, every of the veil connections in the class. And this is something which works for all the parabolic geometry set. For example, in our book with Andy, you can find explicit formulae for all the geometries, right? So, so, so it's actually, if you know nothing and go the blind formal way, you get this kind of formulae for free, except it's again tedious and you have to learn all this back, back, background stuff. And you have to be sure that there is a canonical Cartan connection here, which is not that automatic and easy, right? Uh, but we shall proceed now analogously in our conformally felt fellows of manifolds now, but there we don't have any canonical Cartan connection and nothing. So here, I don't know about any other approach, but the one Mike pushed through. So doing all the straightforward and tedious calculations and guess what the formulas, what the formula should be. Or you can use the approach of Andy and Tomas Salac and, and push the things down from the, from the relevant contact parabolic geometries and have enough control to know what the formula will look like, right? So both is possible. So we are with this Mike doing the first the straightforward pedestrian approach. And you will see it's quite tedious <laughs> in terms of formula. So, so the beginning is very simple because we simply say, that for us, the vector bundles, so, so our symplectic or conformally symmetric, 
and formally syntactic pedos of tractors will be just defined this way, and we will make it into a into a filtration in a very similar way as in the conformal world, conformal Riemannian world, because we simply deem to behave this way. And there you already have to do some good guesses because you can you can notice that if I compare it is here, here I have this line will be exactly the same, whereas this line will have the same symbol here, but something different there. And the difference is that you you have something which is again linear in epsilons, but has got the alpha there. And alpha has got implicitly the epsilon. Right inside. So this is the transformation. Just remember, I will call it two. Uh, one is the joint rescaling for both, both of the conformally symplectic form and the connection. So, so this is our tractor. So you see, it's built up in the way how Tracy Thomas did in twenties in conformal geometry, simply guessing what to put together and how to call it a geometric object. Right. So, so it's very pedestrian approach. So I, I don't see any reason why, why exactly this, except, except the way you usually work. You, you try with the simplest possibilities and some of them might work. So, uh, well, one of the reasons why, the, so one of the possibilities how to check that your choice is okay is that is that to mimic the conformal tractor approach you in particular want to see that there will be the symplectic form on this r n plus two r two n plus two actually right and the symplectic form should be defined the way we are used to right so so it's just this one and then you have to check whether your formula for the rescaling is compatible with that, and it is, right? So, so, so that's the first check that we might have hit the right formula for the rescaling of the tractor. Next, we want to mimic the formula for the, for the conformal tractors, right? So, so this is a beginning which is sort of a copy of what was there. Nearly right, because if I come back again, so here you see, so I've got the G here, so I put J, and here I have the row here with the mu. So this is exactly what we are repeating here. Right, with the J is the row. So, of course, this simple, <coughs> simple guess does not completely work. So what you have to add is this one. But actually, you might see that in the Fedosov gauge, the red part vanishes because the alpha is zero. So actually, for the Fedosov gauge, we see that the connection is roughly absolutely the same as in the conformal geometry. And, and I should point out that, of course, there is absolutely no trouble in defining some connection. But we want the connection to be a nice one. And in particular, you want the connection to be symplectically flat for the CPN. And symplectically flat for CPN means, in particular, that it should be, well, the technical requirement which, which will bring us there is that we would like to see that it will be symplectically flat if the trace free part B of the curvature vanishes. So that's the goal, right? So, so again, having, having people like Mike, it's easy because they simply compute what the commutator of such a guy is. I could never do that, but he did. And, and of course he noticed that it doesn't work. So now you want to modify somehow the connection and you want to modify it into something which is invariant because otherwise it must be behaving well with the rescalings, right? So, so it's good to have some good bricks you can add, which are invariant the right way. And, and that's something which is not so difficult. You can find out that just 
building on the curvature itself, you can you can have two such blocks. So you take the factor and you map it to something which has got zero here, the curvature. So the symmetric part of the curvature times sigma in the middle slot and so on. That's one of the options. And the other option, which seems to be nice and invariant is this one. You take two zeros a year. And then, yeah, I mean, if you put the second, the, the first and second line here, so the third one is already just introduced by force. Yeah, but because you, you don't have much freedom left. So, so this is the two, two bricks. And now you can add any, any combination of those two to our connection formula. And it will again be a connection, right? Because it's sitting in the right space. And you may just check what are the right coefficients to get it symplectically flat if a V is zero. And that's exactly what people like Mike can do. And you find out that you have to add the things as indicated. Yeah? So the black part is visible even in the Pedosov cage, whereas the red part is coming there for all the others. All right? So this is the final formula for our fracture connection. See, it's very still quite similar, except the curvature correction terms are a bit more, more exciting or, or horrifying. I don't know. Depends for whom. Uh, but now, now you have the nice conclusion because now we are nearly done. Because you see, if you compute the commutator, then you get two things. So one is here, and the second one is a multiple of J. So you don't mind this one because this is the one which is allowed for symplectically flat ones. And you are still left to handle this one. But here, the y's are the gradients of V. So you see that if V vanishes, Y vanishes as well. So this will be all zero. So for vanishing Y, it automatically will be symplectically flat. And as we saw in CPN, V was zero. So that was a good hit. We were very happy seeing this. And you see, this is the theorem. The curvature of our tractor connection has got the expected form or the requested form, if and only if the completely trace free part of the, of the curvature is zero. Right. Then there is a observation that if, if it happened that the V is zero, then one can also compute that the trace-free part of the covariant derivative of the phi component of the curvature is automatically zero, which has a nice consequence mentioned in our second paper that if you start with a Kähler manifold then our symplectic fracture connection is symplectically flat if and only if the metric has constant homomorphic sectional curvature which is a not very surprising, but nice characterization, right? Right, and now I've got last few minutes. Uh, so I can come back to the, to the analogs of the BGG, because now we are in good situation. We have got the knowledge that if we start with any vector bundle equipped with a symplectically flat connection over a conformally symplectic manifolds, then we can build the coupled, the coupled, coupled room in other complex. And we know that the complex will be complex, will be exact, except of the first two positions. And we know that the, that the homomorphism theta, which appears in the curvature, is the thing which tells how big the homologies will be. Right. So this is nice and, and it comes for free now. And if we translate it into the, 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 the language of bundles and weights, etc., so, so then it means that if we start with a conformally fetus of manifold of dimension 2n with the trace free part of its curvature vanishing, then whenever we start with some <coughs> G dominant weight. 
So it's this one. We have a sequence of operators of, of known orders. So, so the numbers, the numbers A, B, C, D are actually responsible for the orders. And you get the complex, and the complex will be exact every locally exact everywhere except of the first and second position. And there we know that it will be having the homology given by the sheaves of locally, so locally constant sheaves of the kernel and co kernel of theta. Right, and you come to that from the coupled complex similarly like the PGG. So there, there is just a straightforward way. And just, just recall that theta, as I told, is the automorphism, which is induced from what we see at the curvature level. And these are the groups which are there. And the last slide is here, just coming back to the original problem and having some simple examples. So in dimension four, we can start with the tension bundle. These are the numbers for one forms, two forms, the tractor, the tractors which look like this way. And the whole complex in dimension four is having this many terms, one. And there are the operators which are of second, first, second, first, second order. So this, this is all straightforward. And if you instead start not with not with functions, but with the tension bundle, or one form actually not tension bundle, you come back exactly to the to the operators in the Goldschmidt and Eastwood paper in general of differential geometry. And what they characterize is the exactness here. And these are the operators of there. And now, out of the general result, it's absolutely obvious that there can't be any cohomology, so it will be exact everywhere because, because CPN is simply connected. That's, that's the end of my story for today. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Other questions? No, I Jan, it will be heard. So. Jan, can I just ask a naive yes. question? Uh, the remark about uh, the range uh, uh, of the domain from Is it done by one of the complexes? It's this one. Uh, sorry. It's this one. Awesome. So, yeah. the, the so, so it's at this spot. So, so the kernel of this one shows the range of this one. Other questions? So well, going back to the structure connection uh, for conformity <clears throat> symmetric manifolds. So, in, in, in conformal case, a real conformal case, our uh, parallel sections uh, have a very natural meaning. So it's a scale to, to bring your conformal uh, uh, or the metric to Einstein. So what's, what's the meaning here? I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Because you might also have like, a very natural notion of like uh, Einstein equation as well. So you, you yes. this means that it's against the scale in which you, you get the vanishing. But I mean, I mean, in some sense, the analogy to conform could work only for the for the symplectically flat cases, anyhow, right? Because because there you just get this from the equivalence of of solving this overdetermined first BGG, mm -hmm. and in that particular case, it's actually also true for curved case without. Without restricting to normal solutions, they are no, they are all normal in that case. Whereas, whereas here, of course, for the conformal symplectic case, you could 
you could hope for something similar, but we haven't thought about it. That's no, what we because in, 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 in the dose of cakes, in two pieces of paper, well, or the uh, paper by Gelfand and the uh, collaborators on, on uh -huh. those organicals, there is a notion of an Einstein. I see. So I will have a look. Yeah. So we shall have a look. Uh -huh. so, thanks. That's a very good comment. So there are pretty many things in the chat. I don't know. No, nothing, new. nothing new. Yeah, but that's probably yeah, you know. Know. Yeah? So you, you, you have this condition that uh, there exists a connection and some bound such that the curvature is proportional to the form times some right? mm -hmm. uh, so if it is constant, this is the quantization and only this uh, syntax, right? And then uh, the, the requirement that the combination process is constant is integral of the surface. Do we have such a requirement here? Is it how much it's more changeable? So suppose our form is not integral. No, no, we, we do not need anything about it. About the form, we just we just want to have it symplectically flat. So so the theta can be anything. And uh, what are the requirements of uh, for forming the such that it exists? Such that there exists uh, the bundle of connection. Such that the curvature is. You mean for 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 our j? Yes, for our j for the form. Yeah, well, for no the, idea, no idea. I mean, yeah, sure. So so from our point of view, we we don't have any idea for that because we. We were proud of having split it into these, these two parts. So first having the nice, the nice structure connection, which was the thing which we did in just maybe my grid in 12 and 13. And then we came back to that 15, 16, and we we found out that actually you can really conclude something reasonable because knowing that something is symplectically flat allows us to run all this machinery and get the get the complex right and, and we don't need anything on theta but we didn't think about what would be conditions on the on the pre on the conformal symplectic j to be able to find a nice class and a nice things right it's like a generalization mm -hmm. sorry quantization okay. I, I think it's more local geometry than yes. any, anything global yeah, yeah. So, exactly. Yeah, maybe very general and naive question. So we don't have uh the structure here in quantization, the formation quantization complex, and we can quantize with this. And uh, if we have uh conformal symplectic, is there a notion of quantization? Because we don't have I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I I remember I learned about fetos of structures shortly before this paper of, of Shubin and Gelfan and others appeared from from Misha when, when I met him in 94 in, in Adelaide. He was talking about these things, and I remember from that that time that there is this very nice game. Of swapping symmetric and anti-symmetric and looking what happens and what are the consequences, right? And 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 I never looked myself at the, at the quantization views of these things. Oh, you go the second question. <laughs> so maybe, maybe this is a question more uh, aimed at your third quarter. Uh, uh, because I believe in the 80s, Goldschmidt and Gaspi, they uh, they produce these complexes for Turing operators uh, on symmetric spaces and some on some um, general construction. Uh, I presume CPN is is a symmetric space. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, uh, have uh, we know of some comparisons how that one could compare their general construction? Is I don't know. I don't know. As as thought, I was. I was there mainly in the discussions, and I was always following what one could expect mm -hmm. if it was pushed down. So we didn't want to push it down like like Andy and Tomas did, but I I imagine always what the formulae would look like because the formulae are roughly the formulae from above, right? And so so I possibly could be partly helpful in, in discussing these things and and also then discussing more and. I, I didn't I didn't look up in the background much. Mm -hmm. 
by the context. There's, there's a nice, curious small intersection between old world and old trade. Yes. Yeah, but but this was, I mean, I mean, Mike wanted to have something already seen as a generalization pass before the paper with Goldfield will be published. So he was very eager to do something. And he, he published a paper which I didn't, didn't mention. So it was around the same time, 2012 or 13. And it was, it was the explicit description how the push down looking complex looks like. And it was called something like coercive. Co-effective, yeah. Co-effective complexes. And, and, and also we just were, although we thought it was very premature, Mike insisted in throwing our early preprint to the arc archive, just to have it there before, before the, the paper with Uber appears. But for me, it was some, some motivation and beginning of something we, we studied and I, I never touched it in the wider context. <laughs> 